Welcome everyone to a new lecture within our uh, Jean Monnet uh, sponsored course. Uh, today's course is a special one because today is 9 May Europe Day and we are celebrating a special public lecture within the Eurosci network. And uh, this is uh, offered not only to the main students of this course at the Alexandru Yankuza University of Yash, there's also a group of students connecting from the Stefan Chelmari University of Suchava. And we also have today a very special guest, Nieves Perez Solorzano. She is a senior lecturer in European politics at the University of Bristol. And it's a great honor for us to have her today to give us a, this special lecture. I have known her for a very long time. Maybe <laughs> she doesn't remember, but I met her for the first time in Pittsburgh, in the United States, when I participated there in, um, uh, in a conference, in an academic conference when I was very young. And I met her then for the first time, and I already liked her very much because <laughs> she taught me a word that I didn't know until that time. I will tell her later what word that was. And um, then I followed her career, her successful career, and she has uh, authored many publications. She has been at different universities, also at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, and uh, now for a long time, uh, since 2006, I believe, in the University of Bristol. And uh, at this university, she is a collaborator. She is, works together with Michel Chini, who is a very important uh, figure in the field of European studies, and she is co-author of the book European Union Politics, published by uh, Oxford University Press, which is a reference, is a global reference in the field of European Union studies. So it's a great honor for us, Nieves, to have you today with us. I believe that the topic of the lecture today will be related to the Brexit negotiations, but of course we will bring many different topics. Uh, there are many people watching us now on YouTube as well. There are nine simultaneous connections on YouTube. There is Maria Teofilopoulos, Camelia Teslaru, Sebastian Criscu, Madalina Velnichuk, Joanna Loredana Bukur, and Andrisham, Olia Shavinska, thank you all for your presence. You can ask uh, questions on YouTube. I will pay attention to YouTube and I will be uh, Nieves' uh, navigator in this uh, lecture and I will help her uh, dealing also with the, the people watching on, on YouTube. So without further ado, Nieves, thank you very much for your presence and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Diego, for, for inviting me. Um, this is the first time I'm engaged in this kind of exercise, so bear with me. Um, but also, as I say, I think I think I'm, I'm really excited to be part of, of this initiative, um, which is a um, very new initiative and one that um, is going to give all of us in the in the academic community an exciting example of how to engage uh, in learning uh, in in learning activities without having to go away from our desks, um, which is, I think, a very really interesting way of, 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 of thinking forward about our education activities. Um, so it's, it's a bit odd, in a way, that uh, today's uh, Europe's day, and we're going to be talking about Brexit, uh, which is basically the event by which uh, the United Kingdom is trying to negotiate its way out of the European Union. But my thinking around this and, and trying to think about, about, about what might be of, of interest to all those of you who are uh, connected today um, is to try and discuss Brexit um, both as an outcome 
and as a process. To think about the example of the uh, UK leaving the European Union as an illustration of how, on the one hand, the European Union is managing the exit of a member state, uh, but also to think about um, what that exit, what that status of being a, a former member state that needs to have some kind of relationship uh, with the European Union might look like. Hence this idea of Brexit both as a, as a process of exiting the EU and as an outcome, what that new relationship might look like. Um, so I think I'm going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I don't want to make this a kind of one side uh, preaching in very inverted commas kind of exercise. Um, but just to kind of lay, lay, lay out the, the key ideas um, so that we can then have a, a useful a useful conversation. Um, so thinking about Brexit, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about uh, Brexit as, as a process, I think it matters that we reflect a little bit on, on, on the relevance of, of Brexit itself. If we think about Brexit as the, you know, the first time that a member state votes to leave the European Union, so it's basically an unprecedented um, event, and an unprecedented event that is driven by uh, the referendum result on the 23rd of June of 2016, where basically um, almost 52% of, of those who took part in the, in, the, in the referendum decided to leave uh, the European Union. Um, very much as the, as, the, as the opinion polls from the survey show, voting leave due to concerns around uh, migration, concerns around the effect of free movement in, in, in the United Kingdom, and concerns around, around sovereignty uh, in terms of thinking about the extent to which once a member state uh, joins the European Union, uh, it needs to pull sovereignty to the European Union level, and therefore the EU gets to have a say on legislation that is going to be affected that member state domestically, ranging from areas such as um, such as uh, environmental policy, uh, onto areas around, for example, citizens' rights. Um, so, and, and, and a third aspect of this is, is, is this, the extent to which that uh, Brexit vote also reflected a, um, a uh, protest vote um, against, um, against um, um, the political class and against the effect of, of, of globalization. And, and, and that has been a typically term around the label of, of the left behind, those who do not really uh, enjoy the benefits of European integration, actually feeling that they could have a say about, about, about the situation. And with, with that in mind, what unfolds then is a process which is completely new. It's completely new for the United Kingdom, a country that has typically um, had an awkward relationship with the European Union. It's a country that joins the integration process as part of the European Union late, a country that geographically is detached from mainland Europe, and, 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 and where there seems to be a, an overall consensus, not just amongst the political elites, but also amongst the wider population, that um, what matters is uh, more strongly that relationship with a special partner, being the US, and that what matters when it comes to European integration is a kind of economic benefit of that relationship, and that that relationship should have an economic tone more than a political one, particularly thinking around issues, issues of sovereignty. Um, and as I said, with, with, with that in mind, what then unfolds is the need to design a process uh, through which um, the United Kingdom can um, leave the European Union. And that, um, on the one hand, has a very formal mechanism to itself, but also, as I will be trying to um, show in a minute, uh, it is interesting to see how the European Union has developed a negotiation uh, process um, that uh, builds to a large extent on the existing institutional experience that the EU has had in terms of negotiating trade deals with third partners. Um, as you know, the European Union has exclusive competence over the member states' um, trade policies, but also that builds on um, the experience of negotiating the accession of new member states into the European Union, particularly in line with the institutional developments um, that um, were put in place uh, to uh, manage uh, the uh, Eastern enlargement and, and the subsequent um, Balkan enlargement. So with that in mind, the formal process is in a way a clear cut, is, is uh, defined by Article 50, 
uh, of, 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 the, of the Lisbon Treaty, and it establishes, on the one hand, that it is the member state who decides to leave the EU who should notify uh, the uh, the willingness or the or the desire of the desire to exit the EU. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the United um, Kingdom a, a few months after uh, the uh, negotiate after the um, a referendum result uh, in March 2017. Um, Nieves, yes, I have. You, you said the at the beginning of the uh, your explanation. Yeah. You started like saying that this is uh, Europe Day, uh, and uh, that it's uh, a little bit of a contradiction. That in Europe Day we are discussing about Brexit, right? Yeah. And um, today, you know, being Europe Day, we have many students who are from the very eastern part of Europe. Yes, mm -hmm. countries like Ukraine, like the east of Romania. And uh, it it was a surprise for me when I when I uh, first had a, a Europe Day seminar with them that in different countries this day nine May is uh, celebrated differently. Mm -hmm. So my 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 question for you because you are now on the other extreme of Europe in the most western part mm -hmm. of Europe. How is what does 9 May mean for British people from where you are, for students? Do, do, do they celebrate 9 May or it's just a regular day? They don't remember about 9 May or what do they actually celebrate? Because, for instance, the same day in Ukraine, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a um, bank holiday mm -hmm. and it's not called Europe Day, it's called mm -hmm. Victory Day. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So my question is, if you could tell us about how it's there in Bristol, right? If it's uh, it's not a holiday, obviously. It's not a holiday. Um, students uh, teaching has teaching finished last week, um, so students are currently preparing their assignments. And I think that apart from those students who maybe have been taking some of the EU units that we teach. Um, at the university, this date is passing by. Um, kind uh -huh. of in a, in a, in, a, in a, it's, it's passing by, and and, this, and I think there's very little um, awareness of it. And the situation. You know, not, Olya, yeah. Olya, Olya Shavinska is from Ukraine. Is writing now on YouTube yeah. Yeah. on the chat. She's writing that in Ukraine today they celebrate the Victory Day, mm -hmm. but the Europe Day they celebrate it later at a later. Mm -hmm. Oh well, that's interesting. So it, they are not yet uh, aligned with the EU. I mean, it's about it's about diversity, isn't it? Um, um, but as I say, I, I think what is perhaps special about today in the UK is that um, it was yesterday that the, that the British government finally confirmed that the UK would be taking part in European Parliament elections. So um, there is a discussion about the EU and European Parliament elections in the in the in the in the news in the in the in the media and um, but um, there isn't necessarily a, a framing of that discussion in the context of it is Europe Day let's let's celebrate um, over over half a century of, of, of successful European integration and, and that's where, where a bit my where my my um, Idea about an irony at the start of my of my of my of my um, contribution came from, because typically, um, both in, in 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 sections of the of the academic scholarship, but also in terms of the kind of narrative that we receive from the European Union, the narrative of European integration is always very positive, and and um, perhaps also progressive in nature. No, it's an incremental process, and I think what Brexit is doing. The exit of a member state, the UK from the United uh, the European Union, is doing is actually uh, obliging everyone, whether you're a, you're a practitioner or, or an academic or a politician or somebody with an interest in, in 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 the European Union or EU policies more generally, to stop and think about what it means uh, for, for this narrative and for this uh, celebration and 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 and, and um, recognition of what the integration process in Europe has achieved to 
be in a situation where a, a member state is uh, is working through the process of exiting the EU. Um, yeah. in the context of the country, what the challenges that the EU that the EU faces. You also mentioned that um, um, Brexit is something new, right? Mm -hmm. It's the first time that a country applies for withdrawal of the mm -hmm. EU, but at, at the same time. Uh, the EU is prepared for the kind of negotiations that are involved because indirectly it's, it negotiates the accession of member states and also negotiates the, the um, trade, the treaties, the commercial treaties with other countries. And, uh, and uh, so, so if I understood right, you said it's something new, but there's not completely new, there's some experience, the EU is ready for that. Well, I, I, think, that, I think that there are two aspects to this. On the one hand, it is it is a new and unprecedented event. We haven't had an event like this before, with a country deciding to leave the European Union. But it is interesting to see that as part of, well, initially the constitutional treaty uh, drafting, and then with the drafting of the Lisbon Treaty, there is a real awareness that um, a discussion needs to be had um, about um, what mechanism ought to be in place should a member state decide to leave the European Union? And, and that's the, the contest to the presence of Article 50 um, in the treaty, that the EU, being the EU and, and, and being, uh, um, if you want, uh, an, an, an organisation that is risk averse, has laid out the, if you want, the legal framework through which a member state um, 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 would be able to leave uh, the European Union, you know, to be able to, to, to have to have a, a roadmap, if, if if you want. I think what is interesting, and that's where, where my 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 earlier connection uh, between uh, Brexit enlargement and and the, and the negotiation of, of trade uh, agreements uh, comes from. What is interesting here is to, is to see how the European Union is building on that experience to turn the legal framework within Article 50 into a mechanism to negotiate that exit. So, you know, as I said, Article 50 establishes that the member state who wants to leave needs to needs to uh, rat, um, trigger the Article 50 and, and notify that it's leaving. We have a very clear uh, mechanism in terms of who negotiates on behalf of whom. Um, uh, the European Commission negotiates on behalf of the of the of the of the of the member states, the same mechanism that we see in enlargement and and, and in the negotiation of, of of trade of trade agreements, we have a mechanism through which once the withdrawal agreement is um, is agreed, it, it needs to be ratified by the member states, but also uh, uh, needs uh, needs the assent of the European Parliament. Again, uh, trade agreements and, and accession agreements are negotiated. Are, are, are agreed um, in, in a similar way. And then it also lays out quite clearly what is the relationship of that exiting member state with you know, the wider governance of the European Union, establishing the extent to which that uh, member state cannot participate in discussions pertaining to Brexit. So this is why when there is a European Council meeting, uh, Mrs. May is invited <laughs> to particular time the negotiations are not uh, open to her. Yes. Giacomo Benedetto has just joined. Hi, Giacomo. Hi, Giacomo. Uh, hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you good, good, good morning. Um, and it's nice to join Nieves, Diego, and Tatiana. Mm -hmm. And we also have a group of people from Suchava uh, that uh, have co connected from, from the Stefan Celmari University. And we also have many people watching on YouTube. I am now the managing the the chat on on YouTube. There are many people asking questions, making comments there on YouTube. Do you want to ask uh, Nieves some question? You want Nieves wants to discuss about Brexit negotiations. Would you like her to 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 discuss about anything in particular? Um. Well, one of the questions on, on the Brexit negotiations that I find very curious is this resistance, it seems to me, uh, in the United Kingdom to understand 
how this process works. Mm. So from the very beginning, and not much has changed in fact, from the very beginning of this story, we had ministers in the British government saying things like that they would only need to negotiate with the Germans, that the negotiations would happen only in Berlin, mm. that the commission was irrelevant. And perhaps as we've just heard from Nevis, that in fact the commission does negotiate um, and it negotiates an enlargement. So when all of the countries from Central and Eastern Europe joined, uh, that process was negotiated by the old EU uh, on behalf of the old EU by the Commission. And this is a sort of reverse enlargement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also negotiated by the Commission and the treaty is quite clear on that. The Commission is the external negotiator for the European Union in trade negotiations, uh, and so it has this experience. Uh, the curious thing, the, what 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 baffles me, what 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 causes me to be confused, and this is with me living and teaching in the United Kingdom, is how this is just not understood. That that that, that uh, somehow there's this perception that the only country that matters is Germany, and that they can negotiate directly with with Berlin. Yes, but Giacomo, Giacomo, I have a question for you related to this and for Nieves too. You say that German is uh, not as important as the public believes, that, but, and, you know, when this the, the president of the current commission, uh, Juncker, was appointed, already the, the UK government was not very happy with that appointment. And he is believed to be very close to Germany. And uh, in fact, also his, uh, uh, I don't know how they call it, the chef de cabinet is uh, Martin Selmer, is mm -hmm. also from Germany. So Germany still has a, a, lot, a lot of power even. Sel well, Selmer is now the secretary general of the commission. He's not, he's not the chef de cabinet. Ah. He's so secretary general of the commission. Yeah. So uh, Juncker, Juncker will be will be replaced. He's going to uh, retire this November, and uh, and whoever replaces him will be working with Selmayr. Selmayr will not be retiring. Mm. So it's a personal job, right? It's it's like a functionary job. This secretary general job. Yes. It's the highest ranking. Uh, a functionnaire job in the commission. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. if, if, if I can say something about about you know the, the issue that that Yakimo was raising earlier, and I think um, I think that there's, 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 there's an interesting dynamic going on here, which goes uh, and, and this is a dynamic that has been already identified by other observers of the of the Brexit process, uh, which is on the one hand the it seems to me that there is a, there is a detachment between what seems to be a, a politically driven normative agendas, and then if you want the more perhaps less exciting uh, nitty gritty technicalities linked to how Brexit gets to be negotiated, um, and, uh, and, and that also reflects um, this awkward partner relationship that the, the UK has had with the EU for a long time. Um, uh, observers like uh, Brigitte Lafan, for example, have talked about this idea of how the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom seems to perceive the, the EU as an arena for transactions, not, not a polity, not, 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 a, not a, 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 an entity with very uh, clear rules that actually is geared towards consensus and where not everybody sits around the table thinking about zero sum games. So I think that that on the one hand frames also this, uh, this separation between what seems to be a lack of understanding of the mechanics of how um, the Brexit process would work and that would be illustrated in the, in the lack of readiness of the British, British government um, throughout the negotiation process, where the surprise has been to see a very agile, you know, forward-looking forward um, uh, European Commission supported by very united member state governments. And then a, a British government very much focused on, on, on what seems to me strongly ideological issues 
that are detached from what might be feasible and achievable. No, um, you know, uh, starting with that um, a slogan of Brexit means Brexit. Well, what does that mean? In a way, uh, uh, that there is that there is a set of, of red lines that the, that the British government doesn't want to go over in terms of what sees the Brexit outcome to look like. But then there seems to, there seems to be an, an inability to engage effectively with that process of negotiation um, because the, the eye seems to be on the on the on the final on the final outcome and 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 and, and what that that's. Um, a Brexit or post-Brexit world uh, might might look like, and I think that's a something that for anybody who has an interest in the EU seems surprising, uh, but also something that in a way is shaping the way in, in which the negotiation process um, has um, has evolved. Uh, particularly, if we think if if we think, and, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier, of the way in which um, the European Commission, mandated by the member states, has actually set up the norms that uh, have governed the negotiation process. Again, drawing on previous experiences, the European Commission has come with the idea of, um, of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a process of, of, um, of negotiation that um, focuses on this idea of different stages, you know, front loading the more difficult, the, what I perceive to be the more difficult issues, money, citizens' rights, uh, um, Northern Ireland, and then uh, in, that, in, that, in that separation of, of, the of the negotiation process, look at the issues that seem to be slightly, uh, perhaps less, 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 less complicated. Uh, issues around transparency, um, the British government not wanting to have such high level of transparency in terms of documents being made available to the public. Again, the European Commission created or set up that norm and, and the um, and the and the British government had to follow through. The idea of yeah, nothing is agreed and agreed until everything is agreed. So there's a very uh, clear, if you want, path dependence dynamic in the in the in the in the negotiation process. Um, the way in which the European Union is not allowing the to pick and choose to. So so I think that's, that's the, the dynamics of the negotiation process, which are. Uh, you know, outlining a skeletal form by Article uh, 50 has been have been very skillfully developed by the European Commission, uh, mandated by the member states, and and the British government has very much seems seems to me be playing catch been playing catch up um, with these kinds of with this kind of um, uh, of um, of a structure of the negotiation process that has from the start placed the UK government in, in, the, in, the, in, 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 in the back foot, if you want. Yes, maybe, maybe, maybe I intervene, because he discussed, um, it's related to both uh, Giacomo's and Nieves' point, that the, the, the UK does not seem to understand the EU position. But uh, my question is, if it's uh, that uh, the UK does not understand the how the EU works, or that the UK would like the EU, the EU to work differently, because uh, it uh, seems to me that it's like a philosophical difference that you mentioned, mm -hmm. Nieves, that you said that the UK thinks of the EU in terms of transactions, right? And maybe other countries think of the EU in terms of norms or in terms of identity. Mm. The, the UK is much more pragmatic, much more instrumental. The, the UK would be more in line with like a public choice uh, way of thinking about politics because mm. public choice thinks of politics, entire politics, mm. as transactions, right? Mm. And uh, the, the, the UK is more in, in that philosophical tradition. Do you think it's maybe the case? It's not that the UK do not understand, it's that they do not want to understand or they want to understand it differently. I, I, think, I think that that could be a, a, a potential option. There is a, a different kind of outlook. Um, particularly, I, I think to me there is, there is a discrepancy between 
the mechanics of the negotiation process and the, e and, the, and the norms set up by the EU on, on how this negotiation process um, ought to take place. And then the, the kind of aspirations it, it, it translated into, into the red lines that Mrs. May put forward at the start of the negotiation process. Um, so that I think, so I think, so I think there's, there's a very clear difference in there, which I'm, I'm, I'm not sure is, is necessary. I'm, I'm not sure it can be extrapolated beyond the, beyond uh, the government and the Conservative Party. I think it's, it's very much it's, it's, it's very ideological. But I think the, the, the other aspect, which is also interesting here, is that of course this is a new experience for everybody. This is this is about negotiating the exit of a, of a member state, and I think what what perhaps has not been clearly um, understood by the, by the British government is the extent to which this is no longer a negotiation where consensus needs to be achieved by 28 member states. This is 27 member states negotiating with a third country. So maybe trying to translate, if you want, some of the mechanisms that typically member states would use um, uh, in, in, in the Council of Ministers in terms of developing coalition, or, or hence the, the discussion around Germany, um, cannot, can, are not so uh, relevant in this context. Because what the member states will do is try to seek, seek consensus with each other, think about uh, uh, you know, potential concessions, if needed, that are beneficial to the 27 member states and the EU. As, you know, it was made very clear from the start by, by, by um, Donald Tusk. You know, the, Negotiating Brexit is about damage limitation, but it's about you know protecting the interests of the EU citizens, its businesses, um, and 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 that again may, may have placed the British government in the in the back foot a bit because uh, because any potential you know learning that might have taken place during years of, of EU membership cannot be transferred to how this is being negotiated because de facto the UK is a third country. And it's a, in this negotiation process, and it's, and it's a third country, um, and 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 therefore it's not allowed to draw on some of those of those call them tactics strategies yeah. might yeah. Have in the context yeah. of, of negotiating part of yeah. the EU. Giacomo, Giacomo, I think Giacomo wants to intervene. Yeah. I mean, I I think I think that these are excellent points, and what uh, what strikes me from from what from what I've heard or. or all, all along is is that we start off with this point of a very strong uh, majoritarian democracy in in the UK. Uh, yesterday, I chaired a debate between candidates uh, for the European Parliament from different political parties um, at my university, and uh, there was a candidate from the Brexit Party, which is the new party founded by Nigel Farage, and the Brexit Party has a very different image uh, or has created a very different image compared to to UKIP which was its predecessor uh, and their message is almost one line it, it's really uh, that the that the result of the referendum in three years ago was a democratic result and that that result has to be uh, respected and implemented immediately so their understanding of democracy and its legitimate understanding of democracy is majoritarian, essentially a dictatorship of the majority. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other understandings of democracy that are very different from that. But that understanding of democracy in the United Kingdom is very compelling. So I think that that does indeed explain part of this process, because the European Union is uh, in democratic senses is is a very consensual system. When we talk of consensus democracy, we think most often of countries like Belgium or Switzerland, where for historic reasons the different types of groups in these countries have had to coalesce. And the European Union is in some respects a very large version of Switzerland or Belgium. And that's something very different democratically from from the British or the Anglo-Saxon traditions. So that, that's one thing. The other thing is, again, and I agree very much with Nevis on this, is we've we've um, think of uh, the British not perhaps not fully adjusting for the fact that in these negotiations, it's as if they've already left. 
And until now, when there were previous negotiations in the European Union, the British were, were around the table, they were part of the negotiation together with the others. It's not the case on this, on this, uh, on this occasion. And uh, the particular complicating factor uh, that perhaps wouldn't apply if another country decided to leave, um, let us suppose that Sweden, which is a country that is relatively Eurosceptic, which um, doesn't have the euro as its currency, which only joined the European Union just over 20 years ago, uh, Sweden could opt very possibly for a, a model of third country similar to Norway. It had, that, it had that status before. And I wouldn't foresee these kinds of complications if, if there was a Swede exit, right? Mm -hmm. What complicates this for the British and the British case is the question of Northern Ireland and the border with the rest of Ireland. And the EU defends Ireland because Ireland is a continuing member state. The British have thought, well, they're so much more important economically, they're larger than Ireland. Of course, the EU will, 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 will want to have a settlement with the United Kingdom that is fair for the United Kingdom regardless of Ireland. But I put it to you, or I would put it perhaps to a British negotiator. Let, let's think not of Ireland and the UK, let's think of Bulgaria and Turkey. Imagine that there were, you know, not a, not a military tension, but serious political tension and economic tension between Bulgaria and Turkey, for whatever reason. And would it be the case, because Turkey is a very important country, it has a big economy, that the EU and, and Bulgaria is relatively small as an economy, that the EU would, of course, be pragmatic and think about its economic self-interest and try and uh, persuade the Bulgarians to accept whatever Turkey was demanding. No, the EU would defend its member state uh, and would negotiate on behalf of that member state. So I just sort of want to introduce this idea of, as a comparator, if we can actually think through what would happen in a case of some kind of dispute between Bulgaria and Turkey. And this is why the British perhaps underestimated the question uh, uh, that the, the, the Ireland would present. How about Cyprus, uh, Giacomo? Well, that's a good question. Um, it is certainly the case that uh, now that Cyprus um, Cyprus is uh, a, a member state. Uh, the EU is obliged to defend the interests of the government of Cyprus, that is a member government of the European Union. And 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 the and the and the withdrawal agreement does cover. There's a, spe a specific protocol on Cyprus. Um, yes. And the sovereign base is there, and 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 basically the the EU's. Uh, um, I was going to say Monday, but that's not the right word. What the EU is trying to do with that specific protocol is, is ensure that the interests of, of the Cypriots who live and work in those spaces um, are taken into consideration. Again, because it's, it's going to be another border between, yes. between, the, between the EU yeah. and the United Kingdom. Yes. How about uh, this, this border within Cyprus between mm. the north and the south? Is it similar to the problem in Northern Ireland? Is it similar to the problem in Northern Ireland? Um, it's, it's, it's similar to the extent that it's, a, it's an external border of the EU and that there are issues around um, ethnopolitics involved. Um, I think the key, one of the key difference, and, and I'm not an expert on Northern Ireland, so I will be very careful here, is that the European Union is, has an international commitment to protect the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in, in being a guarantor there, mm -hmm. um, the European Union, through the, the 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 famous backstop for Northern Ireland, is trying to find a way to 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 avoid a return um, to the past. Another question, and to avoid having borders between between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Another question related to what you mentioned that uh, the the UK. Uh, as regards Brexit uh, negotiations, is like a third country and negotiates uh, with 27 member states 
is not a part of the negotiating team itself. This seemed to be clearer to me when there was a clear deadline and after two years, either you had an agreement or you were out. But now with the, this more recent uh, uh, European court decisions that the UK can um, revoke mm -hmm. Article 50 notification, yeah. right? And it is not clear anymore that the UK is a third country. And in fact, the, Bre the Brexit party, Farage's party, mm -hmm. they, they, when they saw this, they, they decided that they would have to run for European Union elections. And they said that if you don't let us out, then we will stay, but we will block everything <laughs> inside the EU. So it's, it's, it's not so clear cut anymore that the, the UK is a third country, because in some cases, uh, and we, in, it is part of the negotiation. Well, hold on. Um, on everything except the Brexit negotiations, the UK remains a full member state. So right now, I, I don't know if Theresa May is at the uh, meeting in Sibiu, mm. uh, but um, if they're talking about anything that isn't Brexit, uh, she or her representative can be around the table. Uh, and, that, that, and British members of the European Parliament will be in the European Parliament voting. Mm. Yeah, Giacomo, he, he, this, um, the British commissioner that uh, when Article 50 was, uh, the procedure was started, he resigned. But uh, who is now the British commissioner? Julian King. And he's like a civil servant, right? He's the first time that the UK appoints a commissioner who is a technocrat and not a politician. So he was a, a diplomat. And uh, just before he became the commissioner, he was the British ambassador in Paris. Mm -hmm. But he, I mean, the UK uh, still has a commissioner, right? Yes. The commissioner still has a cabinet. The UK still has a permanent representation. Mm -hmm. It attends the meetings of the council, right? All the meetings except meetings that are about negotiating Brexit, the UK is part of. Yeah, we'll elect, and there are there are there are British citizens inside the Commission who still and inside the other institutions who still hold important roles as um, uh, officials, as directors general, and so on. This is a mess, Nieves. After two years, they are still full members. Mm, uh, a mess for who? When, when I was talking earlier about, about, about the UK being a third, uh, uh, having the category of, of a third country, it is in the context of, of negotiating Brexit. You know, is, is the UK negotiating with election? The, the original procedure of Brexit said sure. you negotiate for two years. Yes. If in two years you don't come to an agreement, it doesn't matter. You stop being a member. Well, that's not that's not what Article Fifty yeah, says. You can further negotiate as a third country. Yeah, but that's not what Article Fifty says. For Article Fifty says the negotiation process lasts for two years, and then the you know if the, if the, if the process is not finished, the, the the exiting member state can request an extension, which is what's happened both in March and April this year. That the process is is not completed. It's, it's completed as far as the EU is concerned. Uh, uh, the agreement, uh, the political declaration, uh, was completed at the end of last year. Is the, the 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 problem or the challenge, uh, depends on how you want to label it, is now on the on the British side, where where basically the the the, the fault lines are emerging very very clearly. Because I think something that that goes back to slightly, slightly to, to the very good points that um, Giacomo uh, was making earlier around the nature of democracy in the in the in the uk is the extent to which uh the conservative government led by mrs may has behaved as if they had majority in parliament when you know after a calling for an unexpected general election the conservative party lost its majority and uh and is depending on on, on the dup so 
it is interesting to see how what we are seeing now is an attempt at seeking consensus in Parliament after 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 three uh, unsuccessful votes to um, to um, carry forward the, the 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 withdrawal agreement because there isn't on the one hand there isn't a majority in Parliament um, in terms of thinking about what kind of outcome um, Parliament is expecting Brexit to be like but also what we see is is the way in which as I said, the British government has behaved as if it had majority in Parliament and then able to impose, if you want, the executive views over the, the legislative and the extent to which there has been no attempt at consensus seeking through the process by uh, the leadership in the in the in the in the in, in, in the government. Which again it seems ironic if we compare to how successful the 27 member states have been. Okay. Uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the public domain, um, present, present a united, a united. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's a valid comparator, but in Spain, for many years, there'd been majority governments or, 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 or with a single party, uh, and in more recent years, that hasn't happened. And it's been noted, certainly by the the, the well-informed foreign media, that. Uh, the leaders of the larger parties who somehow continued in government or formed new governments were um, less disposed to really negotiate and still uh, a coalition between um, the centre party in Spain and the socialists uh, looks unlikely because of political reasons. So it's quite common in a political system which has, uh, which where, where there is a familiarity with the majoritarian outcome, mm. and when the majoritarian outcome doesn't occur mm. because nobody is the overall winner, mm. that that there is this difficulty to adapt to the new circumstances. Uh, uh, and and, and that, that shows in in the way in which in which there's been an inability to aggregate a common national interest within the United Kingdom, plus then the kind of, you know, polit political divisions within within the Conservative Party and within Labour. So I think that um, uh, in itself is, is, is an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon to, to look at, but, but explains um, why we are where we are in the, in the Brexit process, which is that uh, two extensions, two sets of extensions have been negotiated, and, and now the expectation is that um, the, e the UK should be able to leave the EU by the 31st of um, October. But something. Yes, yes. Let's let's uh, uh, let the people in Suchava intervene because they have not intervened yet, <laughs> and maybe they raised the topics. But I, I will have a question later for you and Giacomo about this extension. But uh, let's ask the people in Suchava, Carmen, Carmen Nastase, who is in Suchava or anyone there, please, can you unmute your microphone? Hello? We are making a test today for a new microphone. Can you unmute your microphone on the computer? No? On the computer, you have to unmute it on the computer. On the computer, on Google Hangouts. Your microphone is muted. Any microphone is muted because on Google Hangouts, it's muted. Yes, now it works. Right to speak. I'm yes. Carmen Bogan. <laughs> can you can see? Yes, and, uh, Carmen Bogan. Hi, Carmen. Welcome. Um, you, you know, we have been discussing uh, so far about the Brexit negotiations from a British centric perspective, right? But we are celebrating Europe Day, and Europe is very large. It's from the west to the east, and you are in the most eastern part of the EU. So what is it that interests you about Brexit, where you are now? What is that concerns you? Cheva interesses at the pre-Brexit. Um, I think uh, we are interesting and uh, we are worried if uh, we can see, uh, uh, see that. 
about the rights of the, our um, um, citizen who are um, in uh, Europe now, in different countries of the Europe, with the, uh, the problem of um, these um, workers that are there. So you... What will be their right? What will be uh, their problems for uh, starting uh, the Brexit? Problem. So, so you are concerned about Brexit, about the rights of workers who are now in the UK, but yes. you may be also worried about the contagion effect that this may yes. cause in other countries of Europe, where many yes. Romanians are currently working, right? Because uh, it, uh, this, uh, uh, the pro this uh, problem of, uh, with bre uh, Brexit, uh, can uh, after that uh, can be a more a model a wrong model in my in my vision for other countries can uh, follow this uh, way. That's a very important point. Thank you very much, Carmen. We will make sure that our guests today will discuss about this about citizen yes. rights. Yeah, going if I can, I can say anything. Anything yes. else? We have. Uh, we are uh, interested in. Uh, um, the problem of our uh, students, we will go abroad in this situation for the for UK. We have exchanges, we have uh, Erasmus program mm -hmm. uh, that are uh, uh, in development now with uh, UK. Okay, let's discuss for us, uh, the problem because we have mm -hmm. uh, international exchanges. So the, the rights of, of, of peoples who are residing now in the UK and other member states but also the, the the participation of the UK in European Union educational programs, such as Erasmus, right? Yes, for educational program. Yes. Good. Thank you, Carmen. I put you in mute. Nieves. Nieves. Um, so, so I think I think it's a it's a it's a very um, valid and, and important set of concerns that uh, Carmen has, has mentioned. Um, so on the issue of, of EU citizens' rights, so the rights of EU citizens in this country, um, if there is a withdrawal agreement, um, the withdrawal agreement um, allows for um, those rights to be maintained up until the um, uh, end of the transition period in December 2020. Um, the challenge here is how to protect and, and, and there's a commitment to reciprocity how to protect those rights not just of eu citizens living in the uk but also british citizens living um living abroad ensuring that this that's, that there is some sense of um, equity across europe so what we are seeing now is uh, member states of the european union engaging in bilateral agreements with the british government in terms of um uh, trying to protect the rights um, of their nationals in the EU and vice versa, sorry, in the UK and British citizens in, 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 in each of the member states. Um, and, 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 and the real concern is that with Brexit, EU citizens in this country will be losing rights uh, in the same way in which British citizens living in the, in the, in the EU will lose free movement rights, for example. Um, so this is part of what is being of what is being um, on the on the one hand uh, agreed as part of the withdrawal agreement, but also of what needs to be negotiated to the process. Sorry. How how about Erasmus? Does the withdrawal agreement uh, proposals include anything about Erasmus? So that the UK would, would remain in those programs up until uh, the end of the transition period, and then as part of the negotiations about the future relationship what happens with Erasmus would have to be negotiated. So, so, so there is a, if you want some breathing space until the transition period, if the withdrawal agreement is, uh, is agreed by both the EU and the, and the, and the United Kingdom. Because uh, Erasmus uh, uh, is a successful program of the EU. It's like a, a flagship program of the EU and there are many uh, countries outside the EU who participate mm -hmm. in Erasmus tools such as Switzerland yes. for instance. Yes. Yes. So, so, so 
is the UK interested in, in um, continued participation after the transition or, or not really? British universities certainly are, and, and Universities UK, which is one of the umbrella organizations that represents British universities, is negotiating with the, with the government to try and, 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 and maintain that, uh, that, um, those programs post-Brexit. But again, like with everything else, um, everything is a, is a bit is, is, is a bit in the air until until there is a clear sense of, of, of what happens with the withdrawal agreement um, and and then what kind of future relationship emanates from that something that is interesting uh, is that there is a there is a there are two sets of umbrella organizations cooperating at the moment to protect the rights of EU citizens one is called the three million that represents the interest of EU citizens in the UK and the other one is British in Europe, and I don't know if you if you follow the kind of uh, domestic politics, but uh, of of the UK, but the, the two organisations have got together to come up with the idea of a ring fencing of citizens' rights, so that if there is no withdrawal agreement, um, th th there can be a, a self-standing agreement where there is reciprocity across all the member states and the and the UK, rather than through bilateral agreements to protect the rights of EU citizens in the UK and British citizens in the in the European Union. And um, some some weeks ago, uh, an amendment was put forward in Parliament by Alberto Costa, a Conservative MP, and it was carried through um, as part of, of what ought to be um, a government negotiating priority. Uh, should there be uh, no withdrawal agreement? Um, I, I must say something now. It's um, an acknowledgement, which is that this uh, lecture is uh, co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union through a Jean Monnet Chair in European Political Economy mm -hmm. at Alexandru Iancuza University of Yash in Romania, but also by a Jean Monnet chair at Royal Holloway, University of London, Giacomo. And I followed you on Twitter, Giacomo, you are active on social media, and I saw that you had a conference yesterday also in, in London uh, that was uh, co-sponsored by the uh, European Commission through this uh, Jean Monnet chair that you hold at Royal Holloway. University of London. Can you, can you tell us more about the uh, events that you have organized uh, to celebrate uh, Europe Day? Well, yesterday's uh, event was a debate between candidates from the six most probable parties in the, the European election. Um, we, uh, I organized this for students, but it was also um, open to members of the public, so I publicized it a little bit in the local area. And uh, we had a, a, a meeting of about two hours. Um, the, I introduced the six candidates. They each gave a short speech to say who they were and what were their political priorities in the elections. And then we opened the floor to questions from people in the audience. Well, was, was it a friendly discussion or it was polarized? It, it, was, um, it was friendly. Um, at the end, uh, a supporter of the Brexit party complained that I was unbalanced and biased, uh, not because of the composition of the panel, the people who are on the panel, but also the questions that were coming from the audience and the way that I dealt with them. This raises an interesting question. I, I don't agree with, with him because let me explain who the panelists were. We had uh, somebody from the Brexit party. We had a conservative who uh, was a supporter, a strong supporter of Theresa May. So, uh, somebody who wants Brexit, but wants the Brexit with the withdrawal agreement and with the transition, and who is very frightened of leaving the European Union without a withdrawal agreement, which, which is the preference of the Brexit party. And then the other four candidates were from um, 
parties that were either very opposed to Brexit or partially so. So the, the Labour Party candidate uh, personally was very opposed to Brexit, even if his party isn't. And then we had a Liberal Democrat, a Green, and um, an MEP from this new party called Change UK, which is a centre party, uh, which, um, which uh, also wants to stop Brexit. And um, this question of balance in that context is an interesting one because the Brexit party and to some extent the Conservatives are clear. And if you vote Conservative in these elections, you're expressing a preference for Theresa May's the agreement that Theresa May has concluded with Michel Barnier. If you're voting for the Brexit party, whatever you think of leaving with no agreement, that's a, that's a clear preference. Those who are opposed to Brexit um, have a clear preference, but there are th at least three parties, each of them getting about 10% of the vote, the Greens, the Liberal Democrats, and Change UK, who offer that policy but have not united themselves together into a single party or an alliance. So I have this table where, where, where there are candidates from the different parties sitting around. Three of them come from these smaller parties, which are against Brexit. Uh, one of them, the Labour Party, is ambiguous. The Conservatives want, a, want, a, want a, an agreed Brexit. And Brexit Party wants a radical Brexit with no agreement. And so because I included candidates from these more moderate anti-Brexit parties, that was an allegation of bias or one-sidedness in the debate. And I realise, therefore, it's quite difficult to organise an, an event or a political occasion where everybody can be happy with uh the legitimacy of the organization now that was something that that i learned yesterday so what i found with my jean monet events and i'm only referring to the one that i organized yesterday is that they for me have been learning experiences other events i've organized this year have been ones with external speakers so the most recent Giacomo, Giacomo, related yeah. to what you just said that you were accused of being biased and um this is not the first time that uh, uk uh, Eurosceptics, uh, UK, UKIP members, when Farage was a member of UKIP, uh, I remember there is a video on YouTube in which he accuses uh, an Irish uh, Jean Monnet professor of uh, being a propagandist, an EU propagandist, to be on the payroll of the EU. Do you think that the Jean Monnet uh, initiative is inherently biased? Um, no. So, I mean, there is an incidence between expertise and, if you want to say, bias in some respect, right? So, I became um, a lecturer and later a senior lecturer in. Um, European studies because it's something that I had studied and researched and the reason why I had studied and researched it was because originally I found European integration something really interesting and it was I must say at a personal or ideological level for me it was something convincing so of course there was perhaps an ideological reason why at the beginning I was studying this but in so doing I I I learned more and more about it so uh i wouldn't say that the jean monnet chair makes any difference because i already had my job and i still have my job even if i didn't have the jean monnet chair you think it's, and it's not me who gets the money exactly you think it's uh, if it's some bias there may be but it's self-selection bias it's like the people who are uh, naturally more interested in europe or more uh, pro EU, they tend to apply more for these kinds of uh, projects, right? <laughs> yes. Right. Um, I mean, I can think of one 
There's one colleague who is an expert in European studies or in European Union politics who is now a Eurosceptic. Uh, he has some interesting reasons for doing so. It's a, a colleague at the University of Cambridge called Christopher Bickerton. Um, uh, and, you know, in future, it might be interesting to invite him to comment on, on, on the position that he has and why he has it. But that's one, he's almost the only expert with, let's say, a scientific knowledge and understanding of, of, of the European Union that has taken that line. Let's uh, ask Nieves uh, a related question, because I know um, from her book, I think you should show us your book, because the, the new edition is a recent one. I have used that, that book uh, very uh, very often because I like it also that it has like a companion uh, multiple choice questions on the internet mm. that are very useful for people teaching uh, European Union related courses, right? Yeah. And uh, your your book is a reference, it's a global reference in, in this respect. So education uh, is something in which you you are very involved, right? And my, my question is related to Giacomo's also, that he said that he was already Europeanist mm -hmm. before he got his Jamonet chair, and he would be Europeanist even if he didn't get his Jamonet chair. Mm -hmm. A similar argument is mentioned about the Erasmus program for students. They say that the Erasmus program, Erasmus scholarships, have failed to Europeanize the people because they are targeted to people who are university students that would be anyway Europeanist. And they say, and if you look at the Brexit referendum results, it was not precisely university students who were Eurosceptics, who were Brexiteers. And they said that they, it's a failure of the Erasmus scholarship program that it targets those students who are anyway Europeanist. What do you think about that, Nieves? I think that's a bit of a simplistic argument. Sorry, um, if you, and, and you've had experience of, of, of working in British academia. I, I, you know, I wouldn't um, label I, my Europeanist. Um, I mean, in fact, I, I always start my teaching saying that, you know, I have an introductory second year course on the EU, that this course is not about trying to turn my students into Europhiles, but rather Eurocritics. And I think so. So, and I think that comes with the territory of what it is like to be uh, an, an academic and to teach in in the context of a of a university. That you, what one tries to do, is to present the students with different perspectives and different angles, so that they can develop their critical abilities. So, so I think that's. I think it's a bit of a, of a broad broad brush um, a, a statement to say that students at university level with an interest in the EU are all Europeanists because my, ex my, my experience, for example, is not that. Um, thinking about the uh, Erasmus program, again, if you, if you think you were using as an example the results of the, of, the, of, the, of the referendum, you could argue that actually the, 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 the Erasmus program has been very successful in that younger generations with an experience of Europe, not only through Erasmus, but particularly through free movements and being able to travel freely in Europe, um, have a, a, a more benign understanding of the integration process than older generations. And some of those students who have been able to benefit from the from the from the Erasmus program um, uh, were not really able to vote in the in the in the 2016 referendum. So this is why. This is this is this is this is strong value for students who would like a second confirmatory referendum of the withdrawal agreement um, to take place, so that they, they 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 could have a say because they feel they couldn't have a say at the time. And in fact, um, again, just having had this discussion with 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 my students, uh, they all felt or many of them felt empowered 
to take part in the European Parliament elections because it is the first time in their lives they're going to be able to use their right to vote to express their views about the European Union, whether in support of you know more in, more EU uh, parties or or, or or more Eurosceptic political parties. Um, so I think I think there is a there is a there is a variation in the in the effect of those of those of those um, European Union programs, uh, and, and 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 I don't think that's whatever it might be changing or shaping the ideology of our younger generations is just about Erasmus. I think a, a, a large part of that is to do with the benefits of free movement and the fact that you know you can go interrailing across Europe or you can you know you can get a flight in, in Bristol and, and fly um, all the way to Berlin or or Faro in Portugal or Rome. You know, this, that, that, well, you that's know, that's this easy. argument about Erasmus um, targeting the, the um, this cohort of university students that tend to be statistically more pro-European, mm -hmm. the argument of an academic article that um, <clears throat> is concerned about the effectiveness of Erasmus in achieving its goal of contributing to a, a sense of European citizenship. Mm -hmm. I, I think the argument is like trying to uh, support other kinds of um, programs, for instance, for schools or for and, and there are programs for schools. Those training yeah. Yeah. nowadays, the university scholarships they they represent the, the the most important part of Erasmus. In fact, Erasmus, uh, the name Erasmus, was previously restricted just to university education. There were other names for vocational training Leonardo or for mm -hmm. lifelong uh, training, they had different names and they chose the name Erasmus now for the whole education mm -hmm. uh, program of the EU because they believed it was the most successful and sometimes the, the EU may be criticized but uh, not it's not a eurosceptic argument it's just an argument that say what if we had invested more on the people in the north of england who don't go to university would this have changed the result of the referendum i i don't know but i think it, it would have been perceived as something quite odd for the european union to go and target a particular region to shape the ideology of its citizens, particularly thinking about that in the context of the, of the UK. Um, so, I mean, there is there is a there is a there is a there is a debate you now there around the extent to which the, the no vote was was also um, driven by these so-called left behind um, people who 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 are not benefiting. Uh, from modern politics and, and 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 the extent to which the the Brexit referendum was an opportunity to express that discontent, uh, but I think that's an issue that that goes beyond Brexit. In in other words, in other words, um, the UK leaving the EU is not going to benefit uh, perhaps um, less wealthy sections of society, um, and 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 there is research showing that that this is not necessarily necessarily the case and that's where some of the ironies around the outcome of the referendum um, come from where yeah poorer regions voted leave uh per perhaps without an, un an understanding or, a, or an awareness of, of of the effect that um eu funding or eu benefits might have in those particular areas hence the, the need for the conservative government to actually very quickly make very broad commitments around being able to match that eu that eu funding uh we still need to be see, to see whether whether those commitments can be can be uh can be um can be met but i think as i said there's, there's, a, there's a wider issue in there um around political engagement and 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 who gets engaged in politics and 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 how to and how to perhaps open up the debate uh, beyond beyond the usual beyond the usual aspects. Mm -hmm. Giacomo, um, 
what what can you tell us about the differences socio-economic geographical differences in public support for the eu in, in, in the uk well i'll 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 come to that in a moment but i just want to come back to something earlier i mean i i i'm i was i was never a propagandist but certainly in terms of of why i chose to to engage in european union politics scientifically it was because i was interested in it and i will say that i was sympathetic to the idea of european integration there's much very very wrong with it and i teach this in my teaching um so you know my own area where i do research is on the budget and on the budget Eurosceptics will make claims that are factually wrong. Um, the, the, the situation with the budget in the EU is now linked to this history over the last decade of the Euro area crisis of an EU that hasn't had the capacity to invest uh, and to support those economies that have faced problems. And yet, the EU budget is officially only 1% of gross domestic product. The real EU budget is actually three times larger. When you calculate the size of all the other real EU programs, there are investment programs, some of which are generated through loans on the financial markets and intervene uh, to shore up the, uh, the, the liquidity of troubled governments. Together with the EU budget itself, these are EU loans, EU funds. We're talking of something approaching 3% of GDP. That extra 2% of GDP, besides the, the, the official budget, is completely unaccountable. There is this massive democratic deficit uh, in terms of managing these funds. And the reason why the de facto budget is 3% of GDP is because politically it's not been possible to, for, 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 for the real budget, the, what, the budget that's only 1%, to be expanded, to take on some of those responsibilities, make it properly politically accountable. So this is the way in which I'm critical of the way of, of how the eu operates um and i'm not sure that there is a solution to these questions so the type of analysis that we offer is different from that of Eurosceptics, whose position is one of hostility um there were problems with the eu's accounts uh, and and auditing those accounts 20 years ago one of the very common comments that you hear from Eurosceptics from people in the in the UK who are who are fighting with the Brexit Party and want the Brexit Party to win the elections is they'll say that the accounts or the budget of the EU is never audited. That's not true. It's always been audited, uh, but the audits discovered problems 20 years ago. So this is the reality in which in which we operate is kind of contentious, and uh, we have to come back to that. And of course, some of us have some previous um, you know, affiliation ideologically uh, when we were younger. Um, I must say that I'm much less convinced of that uh, nowadays, but, uh, and I'm not slow to, to criticize the state of affairs when I think that that's valid. You asked me, um, your question was about the different uh, types of uh, interest that were voting in the referendum in the UK. 48% um, voted to stay inside the European Union and 52% voted to leave. These two blocks are very heterogeneous. There's no such thing as a Remainer who is somehow part of this elite uh, that, that wants to oppress the leavers or the ones who haven't had economic advantage. The, there's immense diversity within the 48% who voted for Remain, and there's immense diversity among that part of the electorate, the 52% who voted to leave. Among some of the Remainers, you will find farmers in rural areas whose preferences and needs are very different from university students or scientists in cosmopolitan cities. There will also be a variety of uh, types who, who, are, who, are, who are wanting to, to vote leave. 
what we find is that it's not really regional, except perhaps in Scotland. Scottish nationalism has driven uh, a greater pro support for the European Union than you find um, outside Scotland. But if we're talking of England and Wales, um, we have uh, London as one of the parts of, of England, which is the most favorable to the European Union. It's not because people are living in London. It's not London that does this to them. It's because of the demographic groups and the types of people you find in London. So the most likely person demographically to vote in favor of leave, to vote in favor of Brexit, is an older man uh, over 65 who um, was working uh, uh, semi-skilled or unskilled in the private sector and who finished school when they were 14, 15 or 16 years of age. Such a man is as likely to vote for Brexit and leave if he lives in London as if he lives in the regions that have been more commonly identified as favoring leave. Okay, Nieves, so, so, so Giacomo mentions this, uh, so he says it's not really geographic, it's more socio-economic, mm -hmm. right? I found now the reference for the article that I mentioned, it was published in the Journal of Common Market Studies in 2012 by Kuhn, and it was uh, why uh, educational programs miss their mark. Uh, Cross-border mobility, education, and European identity. It makes this argument, right, that they are targeted to kinds of people that statistically would anyway be more pro-European, right? But um, my question, you, you mentioned the, uh, the Brexit negotiations, which is the topic of your lecture. It's, uh, you, you said that um, the current uh, deferment uh, uh, is something that was foreseen already in the, in the procedures, in the treaties. Mm -hmm. So it's something normal. And my question to you now is that if after two years without an agreement, if you believe that an extra six months can bring an agreement, if you feel optimistic about uh, this extra time. Do I feel optimistic about the extra time? Um, no, I think um no i think it's, it's it's very difficult to be optimistic about the use that is being made of that extension um mainly because as, as it's been said before uh there is a very clear mission amongst the british political class in terms of what is wanted out of the Brexit process plus there's the issue of northern ireland um i think something which is an interesting dynamic in terms of thinking about how the extensions have worked is that the fact that the European Union has agreed twice to extend the uh, Article 50 process shows the strong commitment of the EU to avoid a no deal Brexit, which, which, which has been there from the start in terms of the kind of general narrative of the, of the, of the member states saying that you know, the, the preference was for a um, for a managed Brexit, uh, a Brexit that uh, would be governed through um, a, an agreed agreement, agreed treaty. Um, so, so that in a way, um, I wonder whether it, it may weaken the EU a little bit in terms of uh, finding itself in a position uh, where it, it is um, rhetorically trapped by its commitment to avoid a no deal Brexit and finding itself in a position where it needs to show to its domestic constituencies in particular, and I'm thinking about uh, the governments in different member states, that they've done everything possible to avoid a hard Brexit without an agreement because the consequences for the EU 27 uh, uh, won't be very, very positive, even though the EU keeps on saying uh, from the start and 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 preparations started in November 
to prepare the EU to to no to no to no Brexit. So, uh, so I think in, in that respect, I think that the EU is is trapped in its own rhetoric of trying to avoid a no deal Brexit. Uh, plus, there's the issue of Northern Ireland. What happens to uh, to the border between the Republic and 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 and, and the and, and, and Northern Ireland? Should is there, be is no, there no Brexit agreement? Yes. Sorry. Is there is there a chance that the UK will eventually not leave? Is there a chance? Um, think about what uh, what Giacomo was saying earlier in terms of the kind of the, the fault lines dividing the different political representatives who attended his uh, his event yesterday. The two main political parties, Conservative and and, and, and Labour, they're Brexit parties. None of them is asking for a, a, a withdrawal of Article Fifty. So. But are they genuinely uh, Brexiteers or they are just Brexiteers because they think public opinion is currently well they are Brexiteers to the to the to the extent that uh, they whip their their the members in parliament to 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 favor the triggering of article 50 um and and none of them is 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 uh, is asking for uh, for a, a withdrawal of, of article 50 so uh, but there's a very clear link uh, uh, with, with what you just said. There's a very clear link, and it goes back to what Akin was saying earlier, between the commitment, the commitment by the um, by Parliament to actually implement what they see as the will of the people via or, or via the uh, outcome of the of the of the 2016 referendum. So, and 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 that is a narrative that is that is. Is permeated um, um, what the political elites are saying about 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 Brexit from the start that they 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 need to uh, implement that mandate from the people. So I think from from that from that perspective, particularly looking at what uh, the two main political parties are are in favour of, I, I think is. It's quite unlikely that the UK will remain in the EU unless there is a second referendum. And in that second referendum, uh, uh, the majority of people, uh, well, the, the option to remain is part of the of the ballot paper, and the majority um, uh, expects or requests um, uh, of favors favors remain in the EU. But again, that's that's something that's something which is is kind of perhaps farther farther down the line. So um, I think that that would be the only the only context within which. Um, the UK will remain in the European Union. Uh, I, I saw there is a petition to Parliament to yes. revoke Article 50. Yes, uh, yes. And that uh, petition uh, has already, I mean, I mean it's interesting. Uh, the, 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 the petition had a lot of momentum. Um, the University of Bristol is in the uh, constituency where most people signed to, to uh, revoke um, Article 50. So this is uh, remain land in a way. Um, but the government hasn't really responded to that petition. It was so, six six million, right? Six million people who signed. No, more than that. More than that. I don't. I don't have the numbers. Do I have the numbers in front of me? I don't have the numbers in front of me. I mean, um, 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 I, I, I'm not sure if it's seven million yet. It's somewhere between six million and seven million. Uh, Giacomo, I have one question for you because I I see that you are more. Um, pragmatic in, in, in these uh, cases. The, the difference in the original referendum was 1.3 million votes, I think. Do, do you think that there could be some European Union policy that could make those 1.3 million people change their mind? No. Um, I think if there were a second referendum and if the result were to remain, it wouldn't be because of anyone changing their mind or very few, it would have been because of demographic change. So previous young, young people who were too young to vote three years ago, gaining the right. And then at the other end of the age scale, uh, some other people who become deceased. Mm -hmm. Um, 
there's been a little bit of evidence of asking people the one quarter of people who didn't vote in three years ago because there was abstention of 25 percent uh if they were more if they really did vote who would they vote for and there was some research i saw that said that there was a tendency among the former abstainers to lean more towards remain so that possibly that's somewhere that that, that, that that support for staying could be gained but i'm if there's a second referendum there's a very high possibility that leave will win it again but yeah, come on, what i think what i think will happen what i think will happen now is uh that there is still not going to be an agreement we will arrive in the month of october without an agreement because the british parliament the, will not accept at the same time it doesn't want to leave with without an agreement but it doesn't like the agreement that the european union has made with the government so there's no way out of this. Um, it, the, the only thing that could really change something at the, during this summer is if Jeremy Corbyn, who is the leader of the Labour Party, is successfully challenged by somebody inside the Labour Party who would become the new leader. And if that happened, then the position of the Labour Party will change. But it's not guaranteed that that will happen. So I think the most probable outcome is that nothing happens. We just continue in this way until October. That's and then in October, there's another request for a further extension. Exactly. That's good news because you said that the people will not change their mind, but some people will come of voting age and other people will die. So the longer... And and Jer the the leader of the Labour Party might change. It might become somebody else, but this isn't certain. Mm -hmm. It's also the a change of the Labour Party leader is is relatively improbable, but it's a possibility. Um, Nieves, I I read in your book the the part about uh, social policy, okay. right? And when you when you discuss about the European Social Fund. And the European Social I, Fund. I, I didn't write that chapter. Greta Faulkner did. Okay. So uh, I didn't take any 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 ownership um, uh, of it. And, and I and I say that the the European Social Fund, in fact, it's uh, an original fund from the start of the uh, European Economic Community. It's from the very start. The there was a European Social Fund that offered some kind of compensation or relief for people who do not benefit so much from European integration. Mm. Wouldn't it be the, 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 the original purpose of this fund to take care of those people who now feel left out by the EU in the UK? Okay, um, I, I think I... I, I... I, I, I share your view about the kind of the normative commitment um, of that particular uh, funding tool. I think, you know, with the EU becoming larger, the criteria to be able to apply for those funds uh, has um, have, have evolved over time. So um, it may be that the funding is spread more thinly over uh, 28 member states than the original funding founding member states of the EU. But I think perhaps the crucial issue here is that when that funding arrives in the member states um, it does so through the sieve of domestic infrastructures and those applying for the funding you know uh, those in the in the know in particular sectors uh, like i mentioned um, agriculture earlier it's, uh, youth programs may be aware of where that funding comes from. But once you zoom out from those, you know, uh, uh, networks or, of, of better informed people or more aware uh, people, whether that, 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 that it is not obvious that funding came from the EU and, 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 and that there's something to be grateful in inverted commas. Yeah. Uh, to the EU. Let's ask the people, the people in Romania, I yeah. think we, we, we should ask them if they're still there. Um, Carmen, Carmen Bogan. Terog. 
please. We will ask them about the European funding, how important it is for their perception of the EU. Carmen. Yes. We have a I'm question here. Now I'm about here. Romania and about you in particular, the people in Suceava. Uh, if you feel European, today is Europe Day. Do you feel European in Suceava? You ask uh, me if we, was in, we are was in Cite European in Suceava, was in Cite European, was in Cite uh, European. Uh, today or uh, in the general? Today, yes, today and in general. In Suceava, in Suceava is a pro European place. Yes, we uh, we felt uh, that we are um, European, we, we make part for the European. Uh, region because we have many connections we have many mobilities uh in the main here in the uh educational level but not only on educational level we have uh, many um, european projects for infrastructure we are involved in uh, our uh, um, Public administration, our public administration of Suceava country is, is very involved in many, it's involved in many European projects. Let us make a test. So facem un experiment. Okay. Avem microfonul farafir. Pot să pasez microfonul la un student din fond? Să scot microfonul din suportul și să pasez? Ca să vedem dacă, dacă merge acolo. Uh, la, la un student, să pasezi la un student. Vreau să te întreb dacă studenții care nu știu, care nu se descurcă în engleză, poți să, vor, să te întrebe și da. în română? Exact, Pentru vorbim în limba română acum. Eu știu că bariera lingvistică nu fie pentru ei un mod de a, de a evita să răspundă. Okay. Dar o să fie în limba română și eu o să fiu traducător. Deci să pasezi microfonul. Okay. La un student că o să pun eu întrebare în limba română. În engleză sau română? Este același. Diego știe și română pentru că dă șanalul de tăi. Dacă vă simțiți europeni, suceava. Să nu fiți timiți. Haideți! 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 Avem camere, se vede că vă învăcodiți. Haideți! Ați fapt să ne știți acum? Haideți! Bună ziua! Cum te numești? Cum? Alo? Cum te numești? Eu cred că microfonul nu merge foarte bine. Merge foarte bine? Nu merge foarte bine? Da, acum, acum merge. Uite! Voi vă simțiți europeiști? Tineri din Suceava vă simțiți europeiști? Eu cred că nu este microfonul acesta selectat. Eu cred că te aud mai bine pe tine, Carmen. Acesta nu era experimentul pe care îl vreau eu să fac. Eu cred că nu ați selectat microfonul acesta fără firca. Acum merge cu microfonul laptopului. De asta te auzeam pe tine și nu aud pe ea. Trebuie selectat Samsung. Este o rotiță și este Samsung acolo. Nieves, we are making an experiment now. Because it's the first time that we try this uh, this microphone to to um, try to make students participate more. But what I told yesterday, you see that we have many barriers, and one of those barriers is the language. Mm -hmm. You see that they said that they didn't want to participate because they were shy because of the language because they. And this is still a very important barrier in Europe. 
Ai reușit? Uh, nu, nu, stai că nu mai găsesc uh, decât ăsta. Este o rotiță pe hangat, sus, mijloc, sus. Dacă ești cu pointerul aproape, apare o rotiță pentru settings. Pentru și acolo trebuie să apară și care este camera selectată și care este microfonul. Da, nu mi apare decât. Nu ți apare microfonul și atunci nu este conectat, poate. Dar lasă, lasă, era doar experimentul, da? Eu am vrut să fac acest experimentul și acum câteva zile, da? Dar am făcut acum și trebuie să mai încercăm, da? Ca să meargă mai bine cu acest microfon. Acum parcă nu este conectat bine, nu a fost recunoscut driverul sau ceva. Dar să nu mai facem probe. Mai devreme se auzea, nu? Mai înainte, da, dar dar nu se de să facem experimente mai târziu. Vă pun pe mult. Yes. So you see that we make great efforts in this network, right? I'm just amazing to you speak Romanian like nothing. We make this possible. We make it. It's great efforts, but now I tell you something which is something new. It's an announcement, right? Which is that now the Eurosci network is trying to become a global network. Mm. The Eurosci network started in Europe, but uh, now we are trying to become global. And we have um, accepted a new partner in Brazil recently but we are currently negotiating a very important partnership that would change the outlook of the network in, in the world. We are trying to welcome a new university from Indonesia. And um, Giacomo doesn't know about that, but uh, we are very close in the well, network. Hello? It works. It works now. Merge. Okay. Alo? Da. Tu te simți europeană? Da, bineînțeles că mă simt europeană. Și, și, ce, ce... Da, și ce întrebarea noastră acum, discutăm ce te face pe tine europeană? Ce este pentru tine cel mai important ca să te simți europeană? Dreptul să călătorești prin Europa? Sau bursele Erasmus? Sau e, altceva? Ce, ce este pentru tine important? Uh, pentru mine toate aceste lucruri sunt importante. Nu pot să spun că unul dintre ele este mai important decât celelalte. Uh, bineînțeles, noi beneficiem în momentul ăsta de, de facilități. Suntem integrați într-un program de practică datorită integrării noastre în Uniunea Europeană și ne ajută foarte mult, ne va ajuta foarte mult în viitor. Și bineînțeles că mă bucur și de această liberă circulație, că pot uh, vizita diferite țări. Este foarte important pentru noi și pentru dezvoltarea noastră ca indivizi. Dacă, dacă ar trebui să renunți la ceva, ori la libera circulație în Europa, ori la fondurile europene, la ce ai renunța? Mm, grea întrebare. Uh, eu personal, Cred că aș înța la fonduri pentru că îmi place să călătoresc, dar dacă aș întreba pe altcineva, poate ar avea totuși cu totul alt răspuns. Mulțumesc foarte mult și felicitări mm. pentru că acum a mers foarte bine această încercare, acest experiment cu microfonul. Felicitări tuturor, felicitări lui Carmen Astase, decanul la Universitatea Ștefan cel Mare din Suceava, la Facultatea de Economie și felicitări tuturor din echipa ei pentru acest experiment. A fost un mare succes. Felicitări, mulțumesc! Vă pun pe mult! So, I asked a question to this student 
uh, what is more important for her to to feel european to feel that she benefits from being european whether it's the freedom of movement in europe or it's the possibility to access uh, european union funds you know she comes from one of the poorest regions and a region that receives lots of funding she herself herself participates in a training uh, program for traineeships training scholarships and um, i i asked her a very difficult question if she had to give up something either the freedom of movement or european funds what she would she would rather give up and she said that she would give up European funds, that the freedom of movement is the most important for her. And that's why Brexit, that's why the topic mm. of your lecture today is so important for people in Romania and people mm. in the Northeast in particular. So what, what's the, you are also um, Spanish by origin, and now you have, become also British, right? What is your own experience with this? With free movement? Well, I'm a child of the Erasmus program. I mean, you're the <laughs> Erasmus program. I'm a child of the Erasmus program. And I'm, you know, basically making use of my freedom of movement rights. Uh, I, I first went to, well, I first came to the UK with the Erasmus program. Then oh, no, so, so you originally I'm in the UK with Erasmus. Yes, yes. What, I'm a child of Erasmus. Yeah. What university? Um, I went to the University of Sussex in Brighton. Wow, it's the same university where Giacomo got his first degree from, right? Giacomo. Maybe Giacomo and I met then, and we don't remember. <laughs> I well, I'm I'm a child of Erasmus. I was sent from Sussex to France oh. for a year. So, so, so maybe you crossed uh, when you arrived in France. You know, so, 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 and, 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 and so we're talking about what the success of the program. Yeah, maybe I, I, I would have been somebody who would have moved or travelled, but certainly for me it was the Erasmus experience that gave me what the first opportunity to think about whether what living outside my comfort zone. Uh, would be like and then I went to study my postgraduate degree at the College of Europe in Bruges so I spent time in Belgium and then ended up returning to the UK to do my PhD. The College of Europe yes. in Bruges, yeah. how, how is it like? I, I, I know it because Margaret Thatcher gave a lecture there. Yes, the famous but, Bruges. But, uh, is, it, is it really like a hotbed of Europeanist agitation? Or Europeanist agitation. I never thought about it in those terms. Uh, for, me, for me, it was an excellent experience. It's, it's what got me hooked on European Union issues. Um, and, and I remember it was, it was a steep learning experience. Uh, there were lots of people in there who were very knowledgeable about the EU and, and I wasn't. Um, but it was a fantastic experience because suddenly you, you were in a place, I mean, it's a bit like your experiment here. You don't have to move from your desk to meet people from very different national, social, cultural backgrounds. And then, you know, those very famous scholars you were reading, whose words you were reading, uh, came and, and, and taught us. And, 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 and then we also had the chance to, 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 um, to have practitioners coming to, um, you know, discuss their experiences. So for me, that, that was the, the hook that got me interested in, in European in European Union in European Union politics. So say in that sense, I'm I'm a child of the of the benefits that uh, have developed from European integration, in terms how, of how, European how about, and also in terms okay. of free movement. Yes, they, how about the European University Institute? I know there was a controversy in the UK because the UK leaves the. EUI. Yes. It was like a consortium, like an agreement outside the EU to be part of this. And, and the UK is leaving that. And, and they are leaving. In the same way in which the UK government has stopped uh, providing scholarships to fund British citizens to go to the College of Europe. 
So now there is an alumni fund. Yes, um, Brexit has many work. implications. So it's also this uh, European Space Agency. Mm. We have in the network now, we are negotiating the accession also of um, a university that is very powerful in aerospace technology, aerospace, rocket science, right? Mm -hmm. And the satellites and so on. And now that the UK is leaving and they, they are also leaving Galileo, right? Mm -hmm. This uh, global navigation system, satellite system of the EU, but they are still part of the European Space Agency. Mm -hmm. So will they leave that too or not? It's I think it will, it will depend on what is negotiated as part of, of the post-Brexit post -Brexit mm -hmm. environment. And, 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 and that's where, again, the, the reality of what being a third country becomes quite obvious. Mm -hmm. you know, so as, as, uh, that is being, you know, that leaving the European Union is is is, 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 is very complex process that has I, I said, implications. I said before, Nieves, that this negotiation, it looks to me like a mess. But it's because also of my personal, my frustration, right? That yeah. this, they do not come to an agreement. But I, now as a kind of conclusion, because we are running out of time, okay. and they have the opportunity, you and Giacomo, uh, you can like make your final conclusion, what you think about the, 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 these negotiations and, and mostly the prospects for the future, if there's a positive outlook. Yeah, a positive outlook. I mean, I think, again, I, I, I don't, I don't on, a, on, a, on an academic level, I don't find the fact that Brexit is not ended frustrating. It seems to be, it's, 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 it's an interesting uh, phenomenon to study and to be critical about. So in that sense, I'm not frustrated by it. But I think, it's, it's a, it's, as I said, it's, it's, it's an unprecedented situation, one that at the moment is very fluid and that has been an interesting exercise, learning exercise, not just for the UK, but also for the EU and its member states. Um, I think that, it, it well, it, it is a complex process. I, I'm not discovering anything, anything new here. And a complex process that is going to have short-term and very clearly long-term effects both for the uk and the and the eu you've mentioned some of the uh, short-term effects for the for the for potential effects for the uk but also for the eu you know the sh once the, U the eu leaves the uk leaves the shape of the european parliament will change you know the the the, the, the strong component of of, of labor uh, meps in, in 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 the in the socialist group will go the number of meps will change um some of the kind of more you know the normative influences that the, that the UK has been able to exercise on on the EU will disappear. The standing of the EU as an international actor without the UK. Um, so, so I think it's a, it's an unprecedented process, one that is fascinating to to watch and to evaluate, and one that is going to be keeping all of us occupied uh, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. That will have important important effects both for the UK and 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 the EU. Giacomo, do you have any question, any final question or comment for? <clears throat> I mean, I want to pick up on something very quickly that you mentioned a, a few moments ago, which was um, whether EU investment in the UK could uh, solve the problem with public opinion and Brexit. Mm -hmm. EU investment in that respect can't discriminate, can't discriminate in, 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 a, in, a, in favour of a particular country. But it is true that the UK hasn't benefited from expenditure from the EU budget uh, as much as it might have done because uh, always, and this is the case also in Romania, local money has to provide part of the funding. And the UK hasn't provided that local, local part funding uh, because the UK gets a rebate in proportion to uh, the UK's mm -hmm. net contribution. So. Uh, any local funding from the UK or any U EU expenditure that occurs inside the United Kingdom reduces the discount from the EU budget that the UK receives. So, for example, my Jean Monnet chair is worth about 35,000, uh, um, 43,000 euro, we're talking euro, 
Uh, and the effect of that is to reduce the um, rebate that the UK receives by 28,000 euros. So I'm costing uh, the fact that I exist and this is me alone means that the UK rebate is reduced by 28,000 euros. You are a and that provides quite a significant incentive for the UK Treasury to discourage the uptake of, of, of European financial investment in the United Kingdom. Um, Eurosceptics so, have also yeah. made the argument that this yeah. is all our money, we're paying all this money in, we're just getting our money back, why do we want that? So no, let's, it's part let's, of dream. let's dream big now in this final part. How okay, my final, my final second. What will happen now? Um, I think um, the the budget is really, really important, and I think an extension in October might be possible. But sometime before the end of the year 2020, a decision has to be taken in the EU about the next seven-year funding period for the EU budget. Uh, Linked to that will be the question of national discounts like the one that the UK has. And at that point, the UK will have to decide uh, if uh, it extends its membership, uh, it will, the, the other countries will be in a position to say to the UK, at this point, you have to decide about your contribution to the budget. You're only staying in if you agree effectively our terms for the future of the budget, unless the UK decides unilaterally to revoke uh, its notification of leaving in line with the court decision that you mentioned earlier in our discussions. So I think the question of the budget when it comes up sometime during the next 12 months is going to be fundamental as to the outcome over Brexit. How about the, the appointment of the new commission? Much less. Mm -hmm. who, who are the likely candidates now? The well, if the European People's Party was certain to do well and to be significantly larger than the other groups in the European Parliament, uh, mm -hmm. then the answer to that question would be would be uh, Weber, who is the candidate, uh, just like Juncker was five years ago. The EPP may be the larger group, but there's not going to have anything approaching a majority, so it's very uncertain. How about now this uh, Hungarian uh, mm, uh, this the the is it prime minister or president comment that they, they, they will not support the EPP candidate? Well the the commission only needs to be appointed by a qualified majority of the government. Last time the British government voted against and maybe Hungary did also, but that didn't matter. So you only need 21, 22 of the 27 governments to, to, to agree. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, Nieves, your final, 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 very final conclusion. Um. I thought I had done that already. I don't, I don't have anything else to to add on okay. that. But I think that the point that, that Giacomo has made around around the effects that uh, internal processes within the EU may have on on the direction and and the potential conclusion of the Brexit process um, um, is, is 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 a very important one. But also don't forget that this is just one stage of negotiation. That what comes next is uh, negotiating that future relationship and 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 that it may be more painstaking and even longer uh, than the th over three years that's that we have um, so far because the uh, withdrawal agreement allows for for a transition period of less than two years i like i like that which is yeah. very short compared to how long it's taking the eu to negotiate the trade I, I, so this is this is but a stage in in in, in what is going to be a lengthier uh, negotiation process about what that what that future post Brexit relationship might look like. I like that as a conclusion. Yes, thank you very much for, thank your, you for inviting me, for, and thank you everybody else and Giacomo and, and, your, and David Carmen and everybody else. I, I think it's a conclusion that we have made that Brexit is not the end of the game. <laughs> An end is a beginning also. 
and uh, even in the event of of the uk leaving the eu a new relationship would have to be negotiated which would be more work for people like nieves and giacomo to research and to teach and to discuss with people like us these very interesting topics i thank you all very much for your presence and i thank also the students who have joined us by youtube we have awarded a number of points to students to Anadita, Emilia Buruyana, Maria Teofolopoulos, and Andrisham, Madalina Vernichuk, Camelia Teslaru. I thank you all very much for your participation and for your attention. We will also include a new seminar question this week that you will have to answer online on our platform at eurosci.net uh, that will be related to uh, Nieves Perez Solorzano's lecture today about EU Brexit uh, negotiations. I thank you everyone once again for your participation and see you next week. Bye bye. Bye. <clears throat>